Barry Building, who seemed to not cross paths often enough, and he was telling me he's, this January he's already been at Berkeley three years. So uh, Damien does lots of fascinating things on, on all kinds of systems. He, you know, he works on birds, too, so he's allowed to speak in our, our seminar. <laughs> but, uh, but he caught me unawares. Today he's going to talk about uh, non-birds. So it's going to be multimodal communication in jumping spiders. So welcome, Damien. Well, thanks. Uh, and thanks for inviting me. This is, uh, I've, you'll probably see me often in the back because I find this a, uh, an amazing sort of set of talks. And so I was going to, you know, I'm going to hear talk about my work. I'm cheating a little bit. I'm going to talk about an invertebrate. But at the beginning in my introduction, I threw in some uh, vertebrates just to appease the uh, invertebrate haters uh, in the audience. So I'm going to be talking about the system that I started working on for my PhD uh, dissertation and have essentially taken it through my postdoc projects and, and to my lab here at Berkeley. And this is working on communication in jumping spiders and in particular multimodal communication. Now the sort of philosophy that I was trained in um, was uh, this, the Krogh's principle. And so this door gentleman here is August Krogh and he uh, posited that for any question a biologist might care to pose, there's an animal particularly well suited to provide an answer. And he um, and people, proponents of this philosophy, have studied uh, what are kind of known as sensory specialists. And these are animals that have very extreme adaptations in either their physiology, morphology, or behavior, or some combination of them. And this is sort of, there's a bunch of examples in the literature. These are just some of my favorite ones. Uh, for example, star-nosed mole have this exquisite sense of touch. Things like bats have amazing hearing. And by understanding animals that are driven by one particular type of morphology, um, it, we've been able to understand some general principles about physiology, about ecology, and about evolution. Now, what questions am I interested in? I've been for many years sort of really fascinated by communication. Uh, and I'm interested in this question in a lot of different uh, levels. Uh, for example, sort of the functional meaning of, the, the function of signals, what do they mean? Uh, how, and also some mechanistic questions, how signals are produced, how signals are detected and processed in their nervous system, and also how signals change receiver's behavior. Now in particular, I've been very interested in understanding complex signals. And so, Signals have been shown to do a bunch of different things, but there are certain things that you can say are complex. And so what do I mean by this? This is a very vague term, and purposely it's a little vague, but signals can be complex in many different ways. And the idea behind all of my work is to understand what drives the evolution of complex signals. So how are signals complex? Well, some displays have more spectral and temporal structure than others. And here we go through some some bird bits for you. So you can have simple displays like this cricket frog, these little clicking uh, acoustic signals that they do, uh, males use to attract mates. And just because I'm perverse, and here's a complex, so this is what they look like, very simple structure, temporarily and spectrally. And there's also signals that are more complex, that have more sort of things going on in the spectral domain and in the time domain. For example, here's a bug here. whales or something. So in these signals, the, the, the temporal structure is much more complex. And you can also see a lot of amplitude modulation and frequency modulation. So some animals put more, <coughs> encode potentially more things into signals. Now, some displays also have more parts than others. And very simply, you can have simple signals like calling. Um, this is a cricket calling. Very simple temporal structure, very simple spectral structure. So this is calling sound, and if you take the same species of cricket and look at its courtship sound, it's much different. So much more different parts, and to understand, and one of the things I've always been interested in is to what drives the evolution of signals like this versus signals like this. Now also, some displays are built with more mechanisms using another's, and I sort of term these as multi-component signals. And so you can think of something, uh, and this is again within one bird. This is a mannequin vocalization. So mannequins in the tropics vocalize. So you're here, I have it here. It sings, uh, kind of what you sort of know. Um, but then, some, this same mannequin will also produce a different uh, signal, not using its 
uh, vocal cords, but using feather uh, vibrations. And this is work that I've done. So here, this is where I'm really just uh, uh, throwing in my sort of bird work here. So this is work that I've done in collaboration with Kim Bostwick. And interestingly, if you see what they do when they're making these vocalizations, they lift their wings up and they tap them against each other. And during this, they are not opening their mouths, so they're actually not making any type of vocalization at all. But by tapping the feathers back and forth, they're producing this very tonal song. And if you look at the feathers here that they tap together, this is the, these are the wing feathers, you notice that if this is a normal, a typical feather here, then three of the feathers are extremely modified. They have these very long, uh, sort of very thickened sort of areas, and also, you know, the, there are different shapes. This one is a very thin one. <coughs> so here you have the difference of them. And if you look at how these feathers vibrate, you see how different they are. So if you look at a feather here, so this, this one would be this one right here, right next to the modified feathers, and you vibrate it at certain frequencies, what you see is a, a vibratory profile like this. You see a vibrational energy being traveled across the vein, but the sort of sides kind of flop around. And if you look at the spectrum of these vibrations, you don't see any strong resonances. This line here is where the animal produces these uh, sonations. If you look, on the other hand, at what's happening with this feather, you see a much <coughs> different pattern of vibration. So now, instead of it sort of flopping around, you have very predictable um, sort of movement of the feather, and you also have a very strong resonance characteristic of that feather. So essentially this bird, by using bells or these tuning forks on its feathers and bagging them together, is able to make these very strong tonal signals. And so one of the sort of broad level questions I've been wanting to understand is why animals, why some animals have, can do just fine using vocal signals, while some have developed the use of not only vocal signals, but the addition of these uh, other types of signals made using different uh, mechanisms. And finally, some displays are built using more sensory modalities than others. So some displays are multimodal. <coughs> some displays, the majority of the signal is in one sensory mode, while in others, they use different ones. So, Mockingbird, incredibly complex songs, but they're singing. Everybody you know I could like play this for hours and do you know, many, many different songs. What does he have to do to bring really contrast to this? Everybody's favorite here. So now the song the so now you have a signal that is acoustic. You hear these little clicks, but also very, very visual. So this is a multimodal signal. You never get tired of looking at this. <laughs> but in general, even though the vocalizations of this are much more complex, it, you can also sort of ask questions of what drives the diversity of vocal repertoire here, to what drives the evolution of, of signals that are vocal and uh, visual. So, yes. And so these multimodal signals, <coughs> so signals using two different modalities, and it could be anything from uh, any combination as possible, um, is very common in the animal kingdom. Sort of, these are some of the most um, kind of thought through examples in the in the literature. There's birds of paradise that have this amazing plumage, and they also sing. You have sword tails, which have these 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 elongated visual signals, and also produce specific uh, sort of cocktails of pheromones and chemical signals to things like frogs that sing, but also their, their vocal sac rams against the ground, and this propagates vibrations, and they use them as seismic communication. You have things like shrimp moths. It's a very, very common thing to find animals that signal using multiple modalities. And sort of, kind of, the multimodal nature, I think, is best exemplified by sort of this here, that which uh, this slide is meant to represent the, sort of the ventriloquist effect. When you hear sort of somebody talking, and if you see something moving, your mind binds together that information, so you perceive the dummy talking, when obviously it's not talking. And so your, the, the brain, in a lot of animals, and obviously in humans, uh, binds together information from distinct modalities. So it's a very common uh, sort of a thing that goes on. So why jumping spiders? Why is this a good system to study multimodal signals? Well, before I talk about that, I'm going to say a little bit about communication 
spiders in general. Now, I think when most people think of spiders, they think of this. Uh, they think of a web. And this is actually a very good way of thinking about how spiders see the world because this is essentially an extension of vibrations. They usually sense the world through vibrations. And because of that, they have very well-established uh, vibratory behavior. And if we're talking about communication behavior, um, and here it just shows like some of the wide diversity of webs you can find. And so this is a black widow, female, and this is a male. And the male bounces up and down on the web, and these vibrations are transmitted through the web to a female, which then assesses the male, decides to eat it or not. Now, most, a lot of spiders do not live on webs. They live on the ground. This is a wolf spider here, but they also produce very complex vibratory signals. So here you have a wolf spider. So again, males produce these series of vibrations that are then transmitted along the ground to females that are sitting there listening with their feet and then assessing uh, males and what to do. Now, unlike the majority of spiders, jumping spiders are visual specialists. And you could just sort of look at one, and, sort of, and this sort of jumps out at you. Their eyes are much, ex much exaggerated compared to other spiders. And they actually use vision for the majority of their behaviors. Um, they have very unique frontal eyes. They have multiple adaptations. This tiered retina, which in a, recent, in a paper from Science last week has been shown to be able to give them extraordinary uh, depth perception. They have a telephoto lens built in there. And essentially what all this amounts, amounts to is that their spatial resolution of, of a jumping spider is about five times better than the best insect eye, a dragonfly. And it's only about five times worse than human eye, which is a remarkable thing if you, can, if you think of the, the differences of scale. And so essentially a spider, which is about with an eye about one millimeter in diameter, has about as good resolution as rodents. So they have remarkable visual abilities for an animal that size. And if you look at the brain, you can also see just how much jumping spiders devote to the processing of visual information. This here is a typical spider. Um, this area up here, the supraesophageal ganglia, is where all the visual centers uh, project to. And if you just compare this to the subesophageal ganglia, which projects all the vibratory receptor for, you see how much typical spiders weight vibration versus vision. And if you look at a jumping spider, this here is the, the vibratory center as well. This huge center here is the area that they devote for visual processing. So they're very, very visual. And along with that, they use it uh, for all the things that animals need to do, to eat, to find uh, shelter, and for sex. This is uh, not typical, more like a very super cool uh, <laughs> dance display. So here's a female here, and the male goes through these very elaborate, stereotyped, very complex visual displays. The guy is going to do it again. He still goes this way, goes that way, raising ever up. The female is very interested sort of builds to crescendo, it's getting higher and higher, then <laughs> So those are jumping spiders in general, and the particular group that I've been working on for a long time is this Habernatus genus. And the Habernatus genus has a lot of really unique traits that make them really interesting to think about questions in ecology and evolution. And first, they're really highly diverse. There's over 100 species in North America, with the majority of, of uh, <coughs> diversity happening in the southern US and northern Mexico. Once you get down into the tropics, the diversity really sort of dies down. And anything you can find in the tropics, you can find in Texas. So they're very diverse, one of the most diverse uh, genus in the whole jumping spider family. There's really large number of St. Patrick species uh, in California. Um, a couple hours uh, east, you can find 10 overlapping species that are sympatric, syntopic, just right on top of each other. So there's these really diverse communities of Habernatus. Some males are also very highly ornamented. And in fact, some of the, some of the very uh, earliest uh, writing about Darwin and, uh, and sort of taking his ideas on evolution and sexual selection were talked about with Habernatus in, in in specific, after 20 years uh, after The Origin of Species was published, the Peckhams in North America discussed um, 
the Habernatus in terms of this. And here you go. This is, uh, this is kind of the diversity you see. Sort of all the kind of colors you can imagine. This is California Americanus that's found up in uh, sort of Washington. Uh, this one is found in Arizona, sort of by the deserts, and you know these two are you know local species. You have very very wide diversity of sort of colors and stripes and ornamentation. And also some this, some species. So there's a hundred species, but some species show really extensive geographical variation. These are three examples, but essentially any widely, it seems that most, if not every, widely distributed Habernatus species has very strict geographic and population specific uh, ornaments and, and looks to them. This is Habernatus osculatus, and you can see this one has uh, sort of a black head, this one has more of a yellow head. These are Habernatus tarsalis from California, and if you, this is a species that's found on the beaches in San Diego. And if you sort of go more inland, you find this form here that's more grayish and white. Uh, this is one, I think that's in around Death Valley. And sort of the most well worked out system here is Habernatus pugilis, and these are found in Arizona on different sky islands in Arizona. And on each different sky island, you find very different forms. So here you have a full eyebrow, here you have a half eyebrow, and here you have no eyebrows with a gray face. So very, very, they look very different and they act very different. And sort of finally, the evidence suggests that this genus is relatively new. They evolved about five to six million years ago. So this sort of rapid uh, diversification uh, has happened on a, on a relatively small time scale. And where sort of it gets back to my first question, some species produce vibratory signals. So the idea is being that you have this group that's specialized for vision. Um, they've done, you know, all jumping spiders have done fine with, with vision. And Habernas tends to be a particular specialized example of having very, very obvious ornamentation, but some species produce vibratory signals. So what do I mean by this? So this has been kind of my lab rat for my dissertation, uh, Habernas decennis, and this is what they do. So that's a male. That's a female down here. And during courtship. Males sort of show off their little patterns, little green legs, white face, but they also have these vibrations. female would accept him, he would switch to a whole new sort of bout of songs while he's copulating. They have their own distinct copulatory songs as well. So I was very interested in looking at multimodal communication in Habernatus, and with the general idea being to ask, why has complex multimodal communication evolved in a group that specialized for vision? So I'm going to tell you a little bit about the communication system of Habernatus descendants, uh, essentially, in, in, in uh, mostly Habernatus descendants. I have some other uh, data on some other species. And just so really quickly, when you're looking at communication, you always have to think of the three different things that are involved with it. First, you have a sender. The sender <coughs> wants a receiver to do something, wants to influence the behavior of the receiver in a certain way. So it produces, so here we go, a little cartoon. You have the sender, and it wants the receiver to do a certain behavior. And so the way that it increases the probability that this receiver is going to do this behavior is by producing a set of energy. Now that energy is transferred through some type of channel, and this channel is going to uh, modify this particular, uh, this particular energy. Now the receiver has to be able to have the sensory apparatuses to detect it, 
and then to process it. And then that receiver makes a decision, in quotes, as whether to do what the sender wants it to do or some other behavior that, that uh, you know, doesn't necessarily, isn't necessarily what the sender wants it to do. So in studies of a communication, it's very important to sort of deal with each of these separately before bringing them together again. So for a while here, before coming back to multimodal communication, I'm going to talk about substitute forward communication in particular. And mainly because before I started this work, there was no work at all done on substrate uh, vibrations and jumping spider in particular, their functions and how they made them. So it was very important to sort of start off this, to start off this way, and then sort of then work my way to the particular multimodal nature of it. So here's a bunch of questions. I'm going to talk about the sender, the receiver, and the channel. I'll just skip through this quickly. So I don't have much time to talk about the production mechanisms, but um, just really quickly, I did a bunch of experiments where I did very cruel things to spider, like put little wax backpacks, prevented things from moving, did a bunch of different anatomical studies. So this is, uh, this is uh, the structures a male uses to, to produce sound. Females don't make any sounds at all, so they don't have these specific structures. And using a lot of high-speed video and things like that, so I'm not going to go through this. Uh, I'll go through, I'm going to show you this video here. And this essentially was going to show you that when, if you remember the video, the animal's waving its legs and making these sounds. This essentially will show you that when it was waving its legs, it was not, that was not the thing that was producing the sound. It was the abdomen that was the producing the sound. So the legs, leg movements were doing nothing except being a visual signal, and it was the abdomen that was producing the sound. So this will be important later. So here you have a video of it, and you'll see the legs sort of come down, contact the, the surface, and then after the legs are up and not moving, you'll hear the big sort of loud thumping sound. So I'll play it a few times. So right there, and then so this is when the majority of vibrational energy is being produced. So this will be important because I'm going to argue that the visual signals, so the coloration patterns, the movement of the legs, is independent from the production of vibrations. So they don't see the abdomen moving, and this coordination between visual signals and vibrations are going to be very important. So to please ask me afterwards like how I did this, and you know, this was this was like the majority of my dissertation, so it's very it's, it's kind of interesting to finally be at the point where I can just condense it down to like three slides. But anyway, after many years, I find out that males use essentially a bunch of different, use three independent mechanisms to produce substrate born sounds. They use drumming, they use just vibrations of appendages, and they also use stridulation using structure. So they're able to combine all these different mechanisms to make these um, sort of complex sounds. Now, I'm going to sort of switch to the receiver and essentially ask the question, if females use substrate borne signals in mate choice, and then give you some <coughs> preliminary data on what the substrate borne signals may mean. So first, very simply, are these substrate borne components important in courtship behavior? Do they actually influence the behavior of the receiver? So I did these, this experiment here where, because males are producing all these vibrations using their abdomen and not their legs. You can actually separate these two. And you can mute males by waxing the abdomen to the head. So then the visual signals are completely unaffected, um, but their ability to produce these vibrations are completely gone. Um, and then you can do the same type of treatment where you put a big glob of wax on the head, now not interfering with anything, with either the visual signals or the vibratory signals. And you can do very simple things like pair them randomly with females and look at their behavior, especially uh, the, what males are doing and whether they copulate or not. And because they're spiders, and when you think about spiders, death is always uh, kind of around there. You have to, we, we sort of looked at the incidences of cannibalism. <laughs> so first, males didn't care whether they're weighted down by uh, big giant globs of wax and actually Males don't ever care about anything. They'll court other species. They'll court dead females. There was a very famous uh, work in the 1920s where they courted to little cardboard cutouts with eyes. Males just, just to sort of uh, court anything. Now, interestingly enough, like they, uh, they start off very carefully. They start off very uh, th sort of. They get more. I think the general uh, um, thing with jumping spiders is that they start start off. Uh, very sort of simply and not very intense, and then they sort of get more intense. I think that, that 
usually females would, would attack them by then. But anyway, if you look at mating success, the way you find out is that um, if you look at um, copulations or not, males that could produce sound, these non-muted, had about 60% mating success. And if males were prevented from making vibrations, uh, the mating success really dropped down sort of to about 25%. I think demonstrating that vibrations were an important component <coughs> in their courtship behavior. And if you look, <coughs> so not, you, saw, you see here that there were some animals that did copulate. If you just looked at animals that copulated, what you find is that animals that could produce sound, of only the ones that copulated, ones that could produce sound mated uh, with the females much faster than the ones that could not produce sound. And mm -hmm. this, of course, is very important because you know you have uh, you know you want to do it as fast as possible because there's predators in the environment, other jumping spiders, uh, parasit parasitoid wasps that are sort of <coughs> flying around trying to sort of eat you and. Uh, they're very uh, vulnerable during this uh, period of time. And then finally, uh, females tend to eat males more that could not produce any sound. <coughs> About 35% of males, when they could not produce sound, got eaten, when the uh, percentage of non-muted males was very low here. So vibrations are very important in their <laughs> behavior. So if you look at substrate board signals, you do find that they're important in mate choice. Muted animals are three times less likely to to copulate, take longer to copulate, and are more likely to be cannibalized. But what information could these signals be conveying to females? Now this is of course making the assumption that um, it's a sort of female choice signal that females are detecting variation in this and then making the mating decisions. So we looked at different uh, <coughs> quality measures of males and uh, sort of looked for correlations between different aspects of these different types of sounds with uh, some measure of quality that in other spiders have been shown to be important. And so the first thing we did is look at size, and for uh, looking at size, what we measured is head width. And we found a very interesting result that if you look at two categories of these, of these signals, there's no significant uh, relationship between size of the male and the intensity of the sound. But if you looked at buzzes, those ones, you had a very, you had a pretty strong uh, relationship between the size of the male and the intensity of the vibration that they produced. So bigger males were making louder buzzes. So potentially that when they're buzzing, they're telling the female something about their size. Now we also looked at another sort of measure that's been important in a lot of uh, female choice things, and this is health. And for jumping spiders, the measure of health that we looked at was parasite load. So when I talk about jumping spiders, what do I talk about parasites? Well, if you go out into the field, you often find these hideous blood-sucking mites that are attached to any uh, joint on the spiders. And you know some of them are just absolutely loaded with them. And so we looked at, we made them produce these sounds, and then we just basically counted these ectoparasites on the jumping spiders. And what we found was that for this signal here, the thump, and for this signal, buzz, there was no correlation between parasite load and the intensity of the sound. But for the scrape, the <laughs> signal, you had a very strong relationship where, where scrapes that were lower in intensity had more parasites. So potentially, when they're scraping, they could be telling the female something about their parasite load. And I think these are especially important because this is kind of the area that's that's very close to the female genitals, so you know, it could potentially be some type of they would I they'd probably be transmitted during copulation. So it'd be very important to be able to uh, assess the parasite load of these animals. I still don't know what's happening with thumps, but it does suggest that males are encoding information in different signals about different things about their quality, but of course we have no idea what is happening and whether that's actually true or not. And this is work that I have hours and hours of videotape looking at exactly this. Uh, hopefully, as uh, I somehow magically not, am not teaching or writing grants <laughs> or something, I can analyze this data, but hopefully you can stay tuned for that. <clears throat> now, in addition to those experiments on Habernatus decennis, I also looked at female mate choice in Habernatus pugilis. Now, Habernatus pugilis is this sky island species that I talked about earlier, and so they show extensive morphological variation from population to population. Here is just sort of showing you 
the different drawings of the different displays from different species. So very, very different. And one thing that was shown is that one population of females from the Santa Rita Mountains, the Santa Rita females preferred foreign population males over their own males. So they preferred uh, things that evolutionarily they had never seen because they've been isolated for at least 10,000 years over males that were found in their own populations. And Hebbets and Eileen Hebbets and, and Wayne Madison uh, did some analysis on the visual signals and they concluded that this preference was not uh, due to visual signals. Now, one of the things that they didn't know when they did this when they did the study is that this morphological variation that I showed you is also found in equal counterpart and substrate borne signals. That not only do they look very different in different populations, they also vibrate much differently. And here you have the Santa Rita male here. So the display, they do these palpitations, and then they do these little simple vibratory uh, sort of pulses. He's going to do another one right now. So very simple, very subtle. And, and most of the things it's doing is waving these sort of very kind of thickened and uh, shiny palps um, sort of in rotating them. Now if you compare this to the Atascosa displays, this is a male here. So you have a much more, so first they're not doing the palp rotations, but again that wasn't important, but their vibrations are much more complex, much different than the Santa Rita ones. And if you look at them, the details of them, you can see here that essentially the Atascosa ones, that last one that I showed you, has many different parts to their courtship signals than the uh, Santa Rita ones do. Now these, there's a lot of different, there's a lot of reasons to expect that these little parts here, this A part, are equivalent. And what the Atascosa males do is they add this second part here, this and then also these little pulses at the, at the end. Da, 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 da. So from a perspective of the different parts of a signal, the Atascosa uh, males are, have more complex signals. They have signals that have these additional parts. Now if we look at mate choice in it, and again doing our little non-muted and muted uh, manipulation, what you find first is here, um, this wasn't a significant relationship as the other paper, but uh, there was a strong trend that Santa Rita females, so this is only for Santa Rita females, prefer the Atascosa males over their own males. Okay. Now if you prevent them from making sounds, then this uh, preference goes away. So this preference uh, for foreign males over their local males is being driven by vibrations, by these additional vibrations. Now, there's a lot of different ways to interpret it. My pet hypothesis for this has been that this could potentially show a preference for more complex or novel signals, or sort of flipping it the other way, some type of ability for, for the consequence of females being more uh, manipulated by signals that have these additional elements. So now I'm going to tell you a little bit about the channel and essentially asked how do channel characteristics affect signal <coughs> transmission. Now this is, uh, this is my field site. A lot of people have probably been to Arizona, a beautiful place. I don't look up in the sky looking for birds. I'm looking down at the ground, looking at a bunch of sticks and dirt. There's a spider right there, they're very small. <laughs> and the one thing about these animals that is really striking when you collect them is that they move around a lot. They, they are constantly sort of cruising this sort of habitat. And if you think about what spiders are doing, as essentially they're vibrating on the ground, and that's what they're using to, uh, to make these substrate board signals, then everything that the female and male are standing on is a different channel. So it could be standing on a rock, it could be standing on a leaf, it could be standing on a twig, it could be standing on this dirt, rocks of different sizes. And if you can sort of imagine that the physical characteristics of signal propagation are going to be very, very different on this rock versus this leaf. So this is one of the interesting things about substrate borne communication because communication using substrates, it's much more complicated than other sort of uh, signaling, acoustic signaling even. For example, communication in substrate-borne waves, there's many different types of waves. They move in different directions. 
each wave can have very drastically different physical properties. And as I stated before, there's many distinct channels are available for subject word communication, each with a potentially different property. If you have a bird singing, it's even though propagation through air is very complex, it's only through air. It's not like a bird is singing through air and then jumps in and then steps a few steps and then singing in water and something like that. It's very, very complex and it really sort of it really sort of muddy, it, it really makes it interesting to understand what are the properties of the environment that affect selection on signals. So what we did is we went on the field, um, every time we found a female, a mature female, we would collect that female and then collect whatever she is that we're standing on. And then we took it back to the lab and then with this uh, little vibration actuator I built out of a turntable tone arm, the really nice thing is it has a counterweight so you can actually make it push forward like the weight of a, of a male spider so you can really sort of uh, uh, sort of uh, make sure that you're not affecting the propagation of the signal too much and then you essentially you can play a vibration of your choosing into the substrate so you can play a known signal here here you have frequency sweeps and using a laser vibrometer at some distance from it you can calculate a, a, a tuning function or, a, or a sort of a gain function where you essentially can see the filtering properties of the signal. So I'm going to show you some things like this, but essentially what it would mean is that the higher things are, are stronger than the lower things, and I'll show you more with real uh, data here. So we went on the field and we found out that there were three different types of substrates that females tended to be found on. First there were rocks, so I'm going to show you a bunch of data like this. This is, this is the filtering function of a rock. And so on the x-axis here, y-axis, <laughs> on the y-axis here, you have relative dB, um, so you have intensity. And then on this axis here, on the x-axis, you have frequency. So if a signal was propagated with perfect fidelity, you would get a straight line at zero. So anything below zero means that the signal was attenuated, and the shape of it tells you um, sort of the, the how different parts were attenuated for those. Like with this one, first you tell because it's really below zero that rocks don't propagate vibrations very well. Not the most surprising finding in the world, but if you just look at the relative frequencies here, you see that the best frequencies are transmitted at these lower uh, frequencies versus these higher frequencies. And again, because it's a dB scale and it's a log scale, this, these differences here are pretty, um, pretty large. Now if you look at sand, you find a much different uh, filtering function here. Here you find that at um, frequencies that are higher, uh, here it's about a, I think like 1200 hertz here, you actually have very strong propagation through them. So you have signals that are lower in frequency, any spectral energy in lower frequency would be attenuated quite a bit, but signals that are this higher frequency, there's a nice little band that would pass them. And if you look at leaf litter, you have a very nice uh, environment to propagate signals. Not so good here at the lower frequencies, but at these mid-range to higher frequencies, it's actually quite good. Now, if you map where males are producing these signals at with, with these blue bars, you come up with a very simple prediction that Habernatus descendus females, if uh, vibrations are important, are only going to accept <laughs> males on leaf litter. And they won't accept males on rocks or sand. On rocks, because none of the signals are being propagated very well, and on sand, and not on sand because these lower frequency signals here, the, the, the buzzes, are very strongly attenuated, even though they would be picking up some things here at the higher frequency. So what I did was I took males and females, paired them together in one of these three treatments where they were confined to either a sand habitat, a rock habitat, or a leaf litter habitat, and then looked at whether uh, females copulated with males or not. And what you found is that yes, that females are much more likely to accept males when they're found on leaf litter uh, habitats versus sand or rock habitats. So even though these males and females are, being, are found very often on rock habitats and sand habitats, their courtship is only successful on these leaf habitats. So, and then just to show you that males actually, again, males don't care, they do uh, everything. They, they try just as hard on every habitat. So I think what this suggests, and I, don't, I didn't show you the entire, all the data set, but is that Habernatus descendant signals propagate best on leaf litter, 
they're not as significantly distorted and they're similar between different leaf litter patches compared to rocks or sand. And that females will only accept males on leaf litter more than on rocks or sand. And what I think this suggests is that, again, even though these animals are found in a diversity of habitats, that Habernatus descensus communication is best suited for this leaf litter channel microhabitat. So they're a microhabitat in terms of not where they're living and eating, but only where they're signaling. Again, they're very uh, general predators that are found in a variety of environments. So this sort of comes back to sort of what John Endler wrote, that natural selection is expected to favor signals and signaling behavior that maximize signal reception relative to background noise and minimize signal degradation. So in other words, that the environmental properties are going to affect the signal form. So signals are going to evolve to be best transmitted in some type of, in the environment that those animals are found in. But in, in vibratory habitats where channel availability, availability and heterogeneity is high, it's a little more complex than that. And you can think of two different strategies that would happen. First, it could be general to all potential signaling channels. Now, of course, this would come as at a cost to reliability and information content because you're not going to be able to put in that, like, if you put in a lot of, if you encode a lot of information in spectral content and you're on an environment that doesn't pass those frequencies, then that information wouldn't be sort of received. But you can also think of another strategy is to specialize in one potential signaling channel. And in this case, you're going to increase the signal reliability, but you're, it's going to come at the cost of signaling opportunity because only a subset of these possible sites within the habitat would be suitable. And I really think, and so Habernatus descensus does this, and what I really think is happening is that this is how so many species of Habernatus can overlap in the field. This is why you can have 10 species overlapping. So this, I'm going to talk to you about uh, a community in Arizona that has about six species I found, and I'm going to talk particularly about four species that are found there. So let's assume that I'm not crazy, and in this sort of patch of ground that has a bunch of different, like, sticks and leaves and rocks and sand, that Habernas descensus communication uh, system is particularly suited to leaf litter. What about rocks? So one species here, Habernatus osculatus, again, they're found in all different habitats, but if you want to really find a lot of them, you look on rocks. And so what does their courtship looks like? Look like? So, so signaling only happens very close up, and it's very limited to a very low, to low frequencies, which would be predicted that, again, rocks are a pretty terrible sub substrate to vibrate on. But the part that you would choose to uh, signal at if you're using vibrations would be these lower frequencies one. And this is exactly what Habernatus osculatus does. Now for, so it seems to match up here. Uh, obviously, I don't have any data, but at, at least it's suggestive of this. Now if you look at so Habernatus conjunctus here, these animals, if you want to find a lot of them, you go into uh, riverbeds, so dried riverbeds, really sandy substrates. And these animals produce much more broadband signals, and sort of I cut this off so I could use the same one, but their, their frequencies are sort of much more um, closer to this little peak in the sand, uh, in, in the sand propagation frequency. So, this, I propose that Habernatus conjunctus, their mating behavior is more suited to these sand microhabitats. So what I think is happening in the field is that by Habernatus each evolving to uh, only mate in these specific microhabitats within this larger scale, uh, larger scale sort of landscape, that animals are able to um, sort of diversify and maintain these species boundaries. And of course, it's always more complicated than this, so there are some species that don't make any vibrations at all. So this is Habernatus halini, they just wave their legs around. And I suggest that this, and I propose that this animal could be more of a microhabitat generalist because none of its signals are going to be attenuated depending on the different things that they're found on. So quickly to conclude, um, males of some jumping spiders produce these multimodal displays. Females can detect substrate board signals and they're important in mate choice. And these channel properties impose important constraints on signal design and courtship behavior. Now, this leads to work that is very quickly, uh, <laughs> work that has been going on in my lab since then, is to understand how different signals are packaged. 
And in this case, I've been looking at quantifying vibratory displays and visual ornaments on across the genus in Habernet. And so <coughs> I'm just going to skip this. So essentially, you know, you can think of three different hypotheses on how complexity between modes are related, negative relationship, no relationship, positive relationship. I'll just skip that. And <coughs> From this, this is my prediction, mainly because it's been known for a long time that in a lot of species, um, the <coughs> animals tend to do one thing or another. Uh, Charles Darwin in The Origin of Species said that it's remarkable that birds that sing well are rarely decorated with brilliant colors and other ornaments, and hence bright colors and the power of song seem to replace each other. And this has been shown very nicely in a lot of different systems. This is one of my favorites here, uh, where you have, where you have cardinalite finches that are very bright, having very simple songs, and ones that are very relatively dull have very complex calls. And so here you have um, <clears throat> a graph that shows you as plumage brightness goes up, song complexity uh, increases. So you have this negative relationship. So we wanted to look at this in jumping spiders. We looked at a bunch of, we quantified a bunch of the visual traits, counted uh, the presence of ornaments, looked at variation in, in, cor in courtship signals when this is the different parts of different songs. And we counted this as the unique transitions of songs, and then we mapped this on to the phylogeny of, uh, of Habernatus. And what we found out is that sort of contrary to the expectation and sort of the intuition is that instead of more drably uh, ornamented males singing very complexly and very bright males singing very simply, you had a positive correlation where either animals weren't doing much in the visual domain or the vibratory domain or they were doing everything in the visual and the vibratory domain. So suggesting that somehow visual and vibrational complexity was positively correlated. And so quickly, just to show you what this would look like, this is the cicadas group here, lots of stuff going on. This is the Geronimoi group, not that much stuff going on. And if you look at their ornaments, and here I'm focusing in on the third legs, um, for the animals that had all these vibrations, you have much more things going on than in this leg here. And this leg essentially looks like all the other legs that they don't show to females. Now this again is, was very surprising because there's a lot of reasons to think that there are constraints as to how much signals can do, how much information can be packed into songs, and a lot of sexual selection theory predicts that costly multiple signals are not likely to evolve and that females should instead evolve preferences for single indicators of quality. And so the question is like how can these animals deal with all this this you know having so many signals? And I think the answer comes back to this multimodal communication. So there's a lot of there's a lot of work that has suggested that when when animals, and this is mostly work in humans, process uh, different senses together, there's a lot of advantages. And also from the computational uh, sort of literature, there's this idea of that systems can be uh, robust. So this robust over design hypothesis was suggests that if you want to design a system, a computational system, that is very efficient, then you spread information over uncorrelated channels. So what would this mean? And I very much, okay. So I'm just going to skip this. OK, so this is what you would predict from this robust over design hypothesis. If in order to, if, if you want to design something that is very efficient, what you do is you link um, channels that are uncorrelated. So you would link things that are not, that are, that are very different from each other. In, this, in the jumping spider case, you would link visual traits with vibratory traits that are very independent. And so as you've got more of these channels here, you would have more of these intersections, more of these combinations, unique combinations of signals. And so we sort of showed this here. I'm just going to show you a video because it's always better. So yes, this is what you see. You have, as you get more and more things, they're coordinated more. And the coordination here is things that were uniquely co coordinated together. So a visual, mo a visual uh, ornament moving to a particular song type. And just to show you, here you have cicadas group here. So this is their courtship behavior. This, this is an edited 
video of a of a of a courtship display that would last over an hour. And again, this is a very heavily edited uh, video to this. Okay, and that's it. <laughs> so they, they don't do much. Show their, their ornaments and they leap at females. So, and just quickly, I'm, I'm starting to look at these type of patterns and, other, and, and another set of species. This is work by Maddie Gerard, and then she works on peacock spiders. And this is the display they have. So they have these amazing uh, flaps that they that they sort of bl like blow up, and then they show to females, and they also make vibrations as well. And also, uh, this is another graduate student in the lab, Chrissy Rivera, is looking at Habernatus, but looking instead of looking at, at the evolution of signals. This is, uh, these are very closely related species that are ornamented, looking at groups that have lost their ornaments. So this has happened uh, at least five times from, uh, from sort of the looking at the morphology and, the, and, and looking at the phylogeny of it, that in these, nested within these clades that have very complex ornaments are animals that have lost everything. And again, they've lost their vibrational ornaments, they're, they're, they've lost their vibrational displays and their visual ornaments as well. Sort of with that, um, I think it's an interesting way to look at the evolution of multi-sensory integration, multimodal communication, and thank you for all the people that helped and funded this work. Thanks. You haven't said very much about the females, and I guess since they can be dead, it's Maybe not, they're not doing much, but it seems at some point they must do something. They must either yes. leave, eat the female, the male, or yeah, so they indicate some kind of interest. So unfortunately, um, what females do is they become uh, they they watch males more. The more interested they are, they're not as aggressive. They don't attack the males. They don't eat them, and they sort of just watch. Oftentimes they'll strike at males, and then they'll have to sort of back up their display and then start and, and continue um, from an earlier part. Because one of the things I didn't say, there's a very uh, stereotyped structure as to how these things progress. And so females do have a, a major thing to do with it. And up until I started my lab here, I didn't have the equipment to do this right. Now I do, and that is work that I have collected most of the data for, and it's just waiting to be analyzed. And I'm very excited, because obviously that's a major, major kind of hole in this story. 
you know, females have to be present, and you know, males are not going to just set up camp on some place and start displaying. And they move so much. So there's a re there's I don't think so. Um, they seem to know. I mean, they're, they're much. They, they can see me way better than I can see them. So uh -huh. there's possible that they're just running away from me. But uh, definitely, they do move around quite a bit. Uh -huh. And if I just sort of park myself and I don't move, you see males continuously just exploring the habitats, just traversing very, very wide. Uh, but they don't. They don't display until they actually see yes. a female. Yes, and uh, they don't seem to follow drag lines, which have some chemicals uh -huh. on them. They, they, when they see a female, they start displaying. Uh -huh. So is there strong dimorphism then between males and females in these ornaments? Yes, females so. for, um, in all cases of Habernatus, are drab and cryptic. So do you know which is the ancestral state? Were they, were they both drab or...? The, uh, so the, ancestor, the ancestral species um, has... Uh, the males are drabish, their legs are elongated compared to females, and the legs often have a dark coloration. Uh, compared to females, but from above they look pretty cryptic. But when you look straight at them, the males have longer legs, and they usually have some stripes on the legs. But I, I think, <coughs> especially if you talk the relative scale, they, the difference, the dimorphism is was less so in their ancestors, and uh, they definitely their their signals are very simple uh, compared to anything happening now. Yeah. So do you have a sense of how these St. Patrick communities have actually been assembled? Like whether or not they're diversifying in C2 and exploiting these, evolving to fit different substrate types, or if they're just being this, fit in when they're compatible? I'm not sure yet, and the, and the main reason is that the, uh, so the, the, the sort of the, the so the, the phylogeny was done not using molecular and <coughs> mitochondrial markers. Mitochondrial markers don't make any sense at all, probably because the idea is there might be some Wolbachia thing going around with mitochondrial genes like, you know, going back and forth and not making any sense. And with the three nuclear genes that, that happened, the, at the tips of the trees, you just get these giant polytomies. And so it's been very hard to resolve. But uh, I just submitted a grant to look at transcriptomes to be able to really look at, to sort of hopefully do phylogenies and be able to ask those questions. And um, one of the things that I'm doing is these species in California, which they have multiple colonization events to coastal sand dunes, inland sand dunes, and rocky habitats. <laughs> And so they kind of form uh, these communities with these other species and just sort of see from their perspective what happens first because they have very uh, habitat specific uh, sexual signals. So I think hopefully if I get money to do it, I'll be able to answer that. Yeah? Do the courtship songs have any function? Well, I mean, so this is the main, main question of, of the data that I have, again, sitting up there, <coughs> wasting away. Um, I think so. I think that um, <clears throat> I think that uh, males. I think that in some species, it seems to really be good evidence that uh, males are sort of throwing more at females because females tend to just uh, accept males that are doing more. And also, one of the really weird things you see is you you find that some uh, there's a lot of uh, evidence for introgression in the species. So they seem to mate with species that are really distantly related, and you see some courtship elements pop up that are kind of odd at times, which is kind of like against what you would think of for them making so many but having such complex songs. But um, I think that they have some type of quality, uh, that, that they have some type of quality information in them because females only make once in general. So I think that it's very important to make with the right male and the right male of the right quality. So I really think that that's my path hypothesis, but obviously this is, this needs to be backed up by a lot of data. But so, so occasionally, You'll, you'll have a female watching a male, and she'll just eat him. Yes. Um, no. It's about twenty-five percent of the time. That oh, that's high. So, so there's. I mean, it could be that there's. I mean, for me, listening to these, there's a there's some kind of a break point between fascination and, ex and annoyance. Yeah. <laughs> it's really, and, and when you're watching them, even 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 uh, one of the neat things is when you're watching them, even a female that will eventually uh, mate with a male. You know, he's doing the, da, 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 you know, and then she's sitting there watching, and then at one point she'll start like looking around at flies, looking around, and then that's when he does these big leg flicks, and then she'll like go right back and then start looking at the male. So I also think that there's going to be a combination of, you know, probably quality measures in there, but also just like, you know, hey, I'm still here, like, 
And so, and this is the thing about these complex signals where most of what we know about about uh, sort of mating has to do with these these, these kind of signals that are signals that are a little easier to quantify. Yeah. And so here, it's <laughs> it hurts my brain to think about how it's working, yeah. but it's a fun yeah. it's a fun thing to work on. So David, how can you, you've got these, just a few of them that, that just don't do anything. Mm -hmm. So how can they, how can they persist in, in um, living in an area where you get all of this diversity? Because it seems like they're at least somewhat invasible by, by ones that make, make more complex signals. Yes, definitely. And that's why one of the, one of the main uh, things that I want to get, uh, and, and I think Chrissy is, uh, project is going to look at to look at these species that have lost their ornaments. I think the, the secret is to look, and I have not done it at all, um, I've only been looking at their displays, is to look in depth at the mating system of these species that have very few ornaments. Because you would predict that, you know, females might multiply mate in those species, or they might have some type of other mechanism to pick the right mate, like maybe some cryptic female choice or something like that. But there's definitely we uh, my lab really needs to start looking at these species that are that are dropper to understand their mating system. Okay, we're on this. Thanks, Damien. That's a very interesting.